Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Massimo Tosato. I'm class of 1980. I'm delighted to see so many alumni and so many old friends here in the room tonight. I was honored to uh, be asked to introduce the session entitled Luxury in the Age of Globalization and her moderator, Katie Maison Rouge. I remain very close to the business school across all my life because it meant a lot to me, both personally and professionally. It did change my way of thinking, it did change my way of working. And by the way, I had a fantastic fun in those two years to New York, to which I think the presence of Studio 54 did help a lot at the time. Um, Katie is the exemplification of one of the pillar of Columbia Business School education, theory and practice together. In fact, she is a successful businesswoman as well as a professor. As a businesswoman, she runs KM & Co, a marketing and communication firm specializing in luxury innovation. Among her clients, some small unknown names as Hermes, Christoffel, Trussardi. She's also the founder and investment manager of KFMG, an investment vehicle in retail and luxury startup. As a professor at Columbia University, she teaches luxury strategy. And in, 1912, sorry, in 2012, she was awarded the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence by Columbia Business School. She's also a visiting professor in Madrid at the IE Business School and in Hong Kong at HKUST. She served for 15 years as the US representative of the Comité Colbert in her extracurricular activity. And she's also the co-founder and president of the Luxury Education Foundation since 2004 which has grown to 18 programs that aim to instill in students, alumni, and executives the highest standards of excellence and processes from the luxury field. Now, inevitably, she also wrote a book, a book called The Luxury Alchemist, published by the prestigious House Assouline. And that book received the international award at La Forêt de Livre in 2009. Professor Maison Rouge was also named Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in 2009. So up to you as a moderator of this panel to introduce the other panelists, and uh, I'm keen to listen to your presentation. Thank you, Massimo. So first of all, thank you all for being here today and braving the traffic for those who did come you know, by car. And I would like to thank especially our panelists, so Valérie chapoulot floquet who is the CEO of the Rémy Cointreau Group since 2014. And Valérie and I met in New York when she was the CEO of Louis Vuitton. And before that, she worked for 20 years for L'Oréal in North America, Asia Pacific, Europe, everywhere. And also Christophe Depoux, who is the president for the Clarins Group for uh, Asia Pacific and North America. And we also met in New York when he was the CEO of Gucci. And prior to that, you were the CEO of Gucci in Japan. And prior to that, I don't know if this is better, I feel there is an echo, um, you were running Bluebell, which yeah. basically represents fashion and luxury brands in Asia. Exactly. So welcome to both of you. Unfortunately, you. Fabio Leoncini is uh, at the last minute a problem. He could not leave Milan. But I promise we'll manage the three of us. Um, so first of all, um, we know that right now one of the amazing advantages and opportunities of globalization is talking to a very vast and global clientele. Yet all of you, the luxury brands have a true DNA that is come from their country of origin. So to both of you, and I'll start with you, Valérie, how do you interact with this global clientele at the local level? 
Uh, I would say that um, it depends from a, a brand to another one, uh, from your DNA and your, your strategy. Um, if I take the example of Louis Vuitton, that you might uh, all of you uh, know pretty well, um, this is a, a maison that uh, is uh, totally global, uh, doesn't act very much local in the way that uh, one of the philosophy of the maison uh, is never to develop any product for a specific country or a specific city that could happen in other maisons. It's a question of uh, strategy and, and priority, but to adjust to the client, which is quite different. So the client is global. At Louis Vuitton, for example, and I will elaborate on this point. The, the, at Louis Vuitton, as the maison is totally integrated from conception, production, and distribution, because if you enter any Louis Vuitton store in the world, 100% of the stores are direct and directly managed by the maison, which is not the case of all luxury brands, as you may know, uh, in the world. So it's totally integrated. So when you uh, buy something at Louis Vuitton, you buy a, a product at Louis Vuitton, uh, most of the time uh, it's travelers, so they ask for tax-free. So as a consequence, they give their passport. And as a consequence, we key in their details in the system. And if not, we ask you at least what is your name and your nationality. So at Louis Vuitton, we track you between brackets with your agreement from day one. So wherever you buy in the world, it's a common database. We know who we, you are, and we know exactly your background. So we know exactly what is the behavior of a client, because, for example, uh, we know that some clientele, because of high taxes, uh, travel a lot and buy abroad. So I take the example of Brazilian or Indian. We know every month we follow the business per country, but we follow the business per nationality, for example. And we know every month where Italian, Indian, Brazilian buy, which is quite unusual, because <laughs> in most of the luxury brands, it's not very much integrated and controlled. So we can, in the global world, we can track you individually and we know exactly the way you um, interact with a brand. Where do you buy? What do you buy uh, from day one? This is something quite interesting. This being said, uh, it's very tempting for, for a luxury brand to adjust to a country or to a city, which is sometimes a distortion versus your I would say your strategy and your global approach, because uh, the luxury brand, I've been explained day one when I joined Louis Vuitton, but I, I'm quite sure you know about it, is a point of view, so you don't conduct a lot of research, so it's a point of view, and you bring to the market your point of view. So people who create and develop products have a point of view, either artistic director or creators or designers or the, the, the marketing team, but they have a point of view, and they go for it, and they push it between brackets to the market. At Louis Vuitton, the idea is to say th there is a point of view. We don't want diversion. We don't want to adjust. But if you come to a store and you ask something unique for you, you will be taken in consideration. So I think it's quite a unique point of view. Not all the maisons, and I will give you the mic, uh, Christophe, because you've been at, at Gucci. But at least at Louis Vuitton, the brand, at least when uh, I was still there four years ago, refused to adjust to every single country slash city, which is not the case of every, uh, every uh, luxury brand, but to say luxury is tailor-made and bespoke. So if you enter uh, a Louis Vuitton store, depending on the category you're interested in, on the product you're interested in, you have a lot of opportunities to personalize your product or to bespoke your product from scratch. Um, there is some lines that are pretty much high-end, uh, for which you can tailor-made everything. Of course, you need a little bit of time <laughs> for production because it's in a special uh, workshop in, uh, in France that uh, do, uh, do make it for you, so you need to wait uh, two to three months only, fortunately. But you can have a, a, a very uh, unique bag in terms of shape, leather, color, outside, inside, zip, blah, 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 blah just for you, and nobody will have it because you will create it yourself. So this is a philosophy in a maison like Louis Vuitton, that within a global world where you can track, at least in this maison, 
whomever in a very nice way in order to understand who you are and what is your behavior and your interaction with the maison, we consider that you are the most important person and we are going to tailor made or to personalize uh, part of your uh, needs or dreams. But at the same time, I remember a few years ago, I was, you know, I know the Vuitton store in New York pretty well. And there I was in Shanghai and I did my anthropology tour visiting the stores. And at the time at Vuitton, I was very surprised of two things in the Shanghai store. One, there were some craftsmen, you know, mm -hmm. personalizing the bags. And the other thing is that very prominently, almost when you arrived, you had a men shoe section. Yes. So of course, that's not the case in New York. And I asked and they told me how important that specific um, you know, segment was. So in a way, also by merchandising a little bit differently, same product, but maybe more adapted to a local clientele. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, shoe in the luxury world is extremely predominant in Asia. So the way a, a, a house like Louis Vuitton um, acts is to say, as soon as there is a store to be opened and to be remodeled, um, the maison tries to adjust to the potential of the store and to adjust to the clientele. Uh, not all the stores carries, uh, not all the stores carry all the categories. So the biggest uh, stores, the, the mansion or the flagships, usually we call the maison, they carry everything, including uh, the tailor-made, some of the most high-end tailor-made products I just uh, mentioned. Uh, and the maison carry, of course, leather good, accessories, leather good for men and women, accessories for men and women. And the big difference is going to be, and these you have it everywhere in the world, even in a small store, but in bigger store where we consider there is clientele and, and potential, you have shoes, men and women or not, Le jewelry or not, including watches, and uh, of course, ready to wear, men and women or not. So each single store uh, carries uh, different categories, and within the categories, depending on the potential of the store, you have uh, an offer, which is part of a, what we kind of bag, bag, uh, what we call a backbone, and uh, this backbone is compulsory. So every single store in the world will carry this assortment, and then the store manager and uh, the country cherry pick, uh, and they and they adjust regularly. They cherry pick uh, what seems to be adjusted to the clientele, but yeah. there is no specific product well, that is elaborated. Yeah for yeah. a country or for a city. Mm. And if I remember, Christophe, you told me that in, at Clarence, the, the, in the beauty world, it's not just that it's local by region, it's local by city. And you told to me the, the differences between yeah. Beijing and Shanghai. So can you elaborate on your approach to local market merchandising or products? Yes, totally. And just to, yeah, to share you know, that this point of view that a br luxury brand needs to have, absolutely. <laughs> is you know, not developing anything for anybody. I'm talking about the Gucci and my previous fashion experiences. But you said the key word is about merchandising. It's really how do you do adapt your offer within what you have and to your population. Now, in luxury cosmetics, it's a different world because it's, you know, we are a bit closer to fast moving consumer goods without being because of the price, because of the distribution network because of the kinds of point of engagement we do have with the consumers. And definitely, even though we have, in the same way that the fashion house, you know, has a global view, point of view, which um, you, you must be well, well aware is very digital today because the discovery of a luxury beauty brand now, it's 78 to 82 percent, you know, online, especially for the growing markets, especially APAC, China, but even though, you know, more mature market with elderly uh, consumers like Japan, uh, having also this weight very big. So this global image is being there very often with very much common shared, you know, official uh, sites on Instagram, you know, the Clarins, the Lancôme, all the major brands have those local uh, sites. But as you said, uh, we go one step further to be closer to the consumer because skincare is very intimistic. It's really a functional product. At the same time, it gives you know self-confidence and an image, uh, and we need therefore to adapt the offer. And uh, as you said, you know, and we share the experience. We do consumer insight, you know, and like uh, fashion, uh, luxury um, fashion goods sometimes. But we do 
um, work on luxury insight on the sorry consumer insights, for, and we see big gaps between Shanghai and Beijing. It's so obvious that. Uh, you know, the weather is not the same, that the cycle are not the same, that education is not exactly the same, you know, in the behavior. And definitely we need to adapt a bit of offer, which comes back to the point we were sharing about merchandising, you know, how much space, visibility. Uh, and when I mean merchandising, it's both products and visual, visual merchandising, how much weight we give to those lines and how well we train our people to give the best service. But in beauty, especially for Asia, do you have slightly different products than for other markets? Yes, not really? like most major brands. So at Clarence, we are a bit unique because 93% of our sales are outside France. So since early days, there have been a lot of developments. Uh, and I'm not there to advertise, but the first slimming product for the face was invented by Mr. Courtin, our founder. But by working and discussing with our Japanese clientele, uh, you know, in the early 80s, and uh, we do develop those kind of specific products, you know, based on the consumer's demand, because most of the DNA of the brand has been, you know, uh, has been coming from really this listening of the consumers. And we listen to the consumers, whether they are, you know, in London, whether they're in Paris, uh, in uh, today is Shanghai or Tokyo. And we have a specific whitening range, which, you know, is uh, quite popular within Asia. Uh, we do have, you know, specific, you know, oily skin product and we adapt. Uh, so for the mm -hmm. color shades, you know, that we do have for foundation or any color uh, product mm -hmm. that we need to develop adapted. So it's globa very global, but there we are one step further in, you know, answering the needs yeah. of uh, a clientele. So, you know, we spoke about the lo global local clientele and one of the buzzwords in the luxury field uh, in the last couple of years has been experiences. So everyone sells products, but now, mm. at especially at the retail point in general, you cannot just sell product. And I'm not talking about having nice service, which should be <laughs> granted, I'm talking about real experience. So I'm assuming, first I'll start with you, Christophe, that mm. at the beauty space, you can easily think of experiences because you have the makeup artist and you yes. have that. But tell us a little bit what kind of experiences you're trying to create uh, for your clients to I engage them more than, than in the past. Yes. Uh, and again, when we talk more generally about engagement, it's through that, you know, experience is what is left and, you know, reminds in the mind of a consumer. You know, they leave a store, sometimes they don't remember everything that mm -hmm. they've got, but they remember the experience. So we are really much working on giving a specific experience. Again, that's based on each brand DNA, but also on the expectation from the consumers. We tend to give a very much personalized um, treatment and care, which we call the touch, you know, in our, in our own company, because we start everything with the first contact, human touch. Uh, with people in adapting from 10, 15 minutes, you know, specific care, starting with the hand, uh, offering uh, a new concept we've developed, adapted to, you know, high pace, uh, uh, leaving uh, business women, you know, which is a 30 minutes specific treatment that they come to discover and leave, you know, the our stores with that experience. It takes spaces, but it's really giving something very different to, uh, to the other brands. And as you know, also in the digital age, we need to fight against, you know, more mass products which are coming up. I think we're going to mm -hmm. address that a bit later, but we need really to remain different. And real luxury, you know, is time. And uh, when you have time, what you want is an experience usually. And you, Valérie, you have gone even beyond. You have created the uh, Maison yeah. Rémy Martin. Yes. Uh, so when you move from um, uh, 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 a retailer like Louis Vuitton to, uh, to Rémy, uh, Rémy Cointreau Group, uh, it's a totally different world. While you you combine a lot of uh, di interesting uh, common values, like uh, savoir-faire, heritage, and so forth, so you have uh, iconic uh, maison and brands like uh, Remy Martin. And when I joined the, the company almost few months after, I, I went and uh, attended um, a very interesting uh, experience that the UK team uh, did in London at the time which is to create um, a maison. So they, they booked um, for a, a temporary space, uh, which was a full house for a month. And the idea was to, to say, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen on these, in these floors, but you can join only by invitation. So invitation only. 
uh, kind of membership, which works very well in uh, London, as you know. And the idea was to say we're going to create a few months prior uh, a kind of viral uh, buzz, and we ask uh, a dozen of our um, of our team members mm -hmm. in Paris and in London to pick a uh, few of their uh, stakeholders uh, and to say, for example, the person who's in charge of uh, uh, investor relation, we said, hey, you are connected with, um, with the world of finance. Uh, pick 50 people you want to invite in London because they live in London and, and uh, have them uh, here uh, and they can choose and pick their day because it was uh, open for a month and they can come and experience what is Remy Martin house, which is two brands, Remy Martin and Louis XIII, uh, on three, four floors, and it's a discovery. So in fact, we had a massive success. We did it uh, the first year now. So each year we pick a different location and within the house, we uh, effectively change totally the concept. The year one, for example, it, it was uh, a, 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 as well a test and, a, and we wanted to bench. Uh, what we've done is that we try to explain to most of our visitors, friends and members, um, who we are and what is the cognac about and why Rémi Martin House is very different. So we had some workshop. Uh, we tried to as well um, bench other luxury expertise. So we asked every day we had a different uh, artisan uh, um, craftsmen who were coming and explaining their, their, uh, their, their job. For example, we had um, uh, someone who came a few times uh, during the month to explain how he's doing handmade luxury shoes, etc., etc., in order to, do, to create this parallel of uh, craftsmanship, heritage, transmission, and savoir-faire uh, with our own métier, which is very different, but with a lot of things in common. So we had different uh, workshops within the different floors, different bars where they could test and learn uh, what is cognac and what is long drinks and cocktail. And of course, at one moment, discover all the whole offer of the Maison, including Louis XIII, which is the only uh, luxury uh, brand of the industry. And we created something that has nothing to do uh, and never been done in the market. Uh, and we created the bus, so after the second and the third day, the people who were invited say, hey, my friend, you should be invited because there is something amazing that I never heard about it, and it's a fantastic moment, and, and really we, we live what is cognac and so forth. So we, the person who were able to come once were able to recommend their friends. So we created the buzz, and I think uh, after a month we had more than 1,000 people who joined, and everybody who joined uh, could register as a member of the Maison Rémi Martin London, and every single year, we restart with the same base and we enlarge the club. Uh, as it was a big success day one, we did it uh, the second year in London and we twisted a little bit the concept in order to, to understand as well what people uh, wanted to, to, to experience. Additionally, we exported the concept to other countries. So I was uh, two weeks ago in, uh, in Moscow, for uh, it was their second year, where effectively they have invited, um, I would say, uh, our best clients, and in addition, influencers, bloggers, uh, journalists, or all the people who create buzz in, in Moscow, and which you could imagine uh, what kind of uh, <laughs> crowd it, it was. So we did yeah. it in, in Russia, we did it, mm. uh, it's going to be the third time this fall in China, and in China we pick each year two cities, one first tier city, one second tier city, uh, in order to cover a little bit more the, the country, which is a, a big even continent, uh, and each time we try to adjust to the local culture and the local uh, clientele, um, but each time it's a, it's a different experience and we try to, uh, to improve or to adjust to bring something different and, and unique, but it's a moment where mm. you can spend time, relax, learn, uh, discover a new métier, uh, new craftsmen, uh, discover who we are, uh, what is this industry about, mm. and have a good time. So this is quite unique in the industry. So I always ask, you know, if the business model is still to sell your products, how do you pay for that? If, if you continue to do, I mean, do oh, you just remove a few pages of advertising or how yes, do you? Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, That's clearly. <laughs> but I take, I take another example. I don't know uh, if, um, uh, if you know what is uh, Louis XIII. Louis XIII is a uh, the ultimate experience in cognac, it's a blend of uh, 1,200 eau de vie, uh, the youngest being a 14-year-old uh, aging, 
and the oldest being over 100 years. So it's a totally unique uh, liquid. We don't call it cognac in, in house because it's beyond cognac, but technically, of course, it's a, it's a cognac, cognac appellation. And, and we 13 is my dream uh, will be one day that we just hand sold every single decanter, which is a, a crystal decanter. Um, so we are working on it, but um, because it's a very unique product and a luxury product, um, average price uh, for a 70 CL is uh, 3,000 uh, euro. Uh, we try to bring experience at home. So if, for example, Christophe is a good client or a new client of Louis XIII, I'm going to offer him the opportunity because he's now part of the club to host an event for him and his best friends or his, mm -hmm. I don't know, business uh, contacts or his friends and family because it's going to be his birthday, because he wants mm -hmm. to celebrate something for his business. Mm -hmm. And we're going to organize an event for Christophe where he wants, at his home, yeah. in a hotel, in a restaurant. Usually we try to have a dozen of people because we want a min minimum of intimacy. And we are going to organize a dinner. He will tell us exactly what he wants as a dinner style. And we will story tell at different moments of the dinner what is the story of Louis XIII, why Louis XIII is a luxury mm. good, mm. a luxury brand, mm. and of course with tasting and food pairing all over the dinner. Mm. This is what we call luxury because luxury is something that brings emotion, as you, you mentioned, uh, Christophe, mm. and we want specific experiences that are the most tailor-made. Mm. So this kind of event dinner or equivalent are honestly uh, beyond what most of the people expect. And I can tell you that uh, if your friends attend this kind of dinner that you ask me to organize, most of the time they want to jump in the club, they want to buy and they start to interact with yeah. us. And the beauty of it is that they know us personally because we have teams in every uh, single important country and they can put a face behind the brand, which is the most important in luxury most of the time. And I accept the invitation. I'm <laughs> happy to organize. <laughs> and, and speaking of authenticity, as you mentioned, so Christophe, I think one of the important things for you at Clarence mm. is the ingredients that yeah. you put in the product. And we talked <laughs> about you know, what natural means nowadays, what organic means. Do you want to talk a little bit of what yes. authenticity means for Clarence? Yes. Authenticity, I mean, again, I've been at the DNA of the brand since the very beginning. Again, from all the studies, you know, from the millennials, I mean, Y and Z, I don't want to anticipate, but there's a lot of demand, you know, for things that are really authentic, that they're I ingredients, you know. It's like the French cuisine. If you want to make a good meal, you need good ingredients and a very good kitchen. So cosmetics and beauty is about the same. You need the best ingredients and you need the best cooks, except that it's super high-tech labs that we do work on the plant extracts and uh, that you only find the efficacy through a long battery of uh, you know, tests that are being happening, especially in our case with plants, uh, with phytochemistry. We're going to source those plants like uh, uh, you know, the kangaroo flower, which has never been used you know, in the... Uh, in the past, but which has amazing power to work on your fibroblasts. I, want to, I don't want to be technical today, but basically it brings your, you know, the spring effect of your skin, elasticity, very strongly. And that's a discovery that took, you know, four and a half years, uh, you know, extract, a lot of extractions in our lab, uh, objectivation, meaning uh, testing really the product. But again, coming back to those exp um, ingredients and the storytelling about those ingredients, you know, it's not a wonderful cognac, but it's the storytelling about the ingredients with these plants is also talking a lot to the clients. It's part of the experience. Experience we bring through training on people uh, and explaining how much, you know, research, uh, you know, we have ethnobotanists that travel the world that find those ingredients and being able, able to pass on those amazing stories uh, plus the scientific proofs uh, that comes with the efficacy of the product to, uh, to our clients. But definitely those, this work on the ingredient. And, you know, when we use the word luxury in beauty, it's not always easy because, you know, is really someone waiting for luxury from a skincare functional product? It's beyond, I think. It's not only a concept, but the part of the storytelling that brings naturally the product to a higher level or a higher level of confidence or, or emotional bond. 
is definitely coming from all this storytelling and the truth, the authenticity that is behind. And after that, as you know, you know, women are you know the most uh, educated uh, consumers. They know what is good, what is not that good, and then once you create a real relationship, you you can really build over that. And that's a smaller, you know, a simpler level of experience, but very efficient uh, to keep that engagement level in point. And looking for authenticity, I know that since you've joined the group also, Valérie, you've purchased at least two, if not more, small, mm -hmm. authentic brands, Westland oh. um, Distillery and the Domaine mm -hmm. des Hautes Could you tell us a little bit your continuous search for authentic brand within the group? Yes, uh, I was lucky because when I joined the group two years prior, um, we bought uh, a, a first um, single malt distillery in Scotland. So I don't know if you've ever been to Isla in Scotland, which is uh, <laughs> quite tough to, to reach because you never know when you land and you never know when you go back because uh, there is no uh, radar at the little airport. So as soon as it's dark or as soon as uh, the weather is bad, uh, the airport is closed. So and most of the time the boat uh, doesn't work either. So anyway, it's a, it's a very remote place, but fantastic place. And uh, the um, Brooklady distillery um, that uh, has been bought uh, six years ago, so two years prior I joined, uh, gave us a hint on um, what is the big trend in, in this industry, uh, which is dual. Uh, the first is that most of the clients, which I, by the way, experienced myself in the past, either in the beauty industry or in the luxury, which is that in most industries in the world, uh, which is either consumer good or a service, the markets are stretching, meaning that um, either you go upscale and you go to the upper part of the market, and there is a big search for high-end products, high-end service uh, at high price, or you stay mostly at the entry price. If you stay in the middle, you're a bit nowhere. We call it in French a ventre mou, and there the trouble starts. So you better be to choose your, your field and where you want to be. So buying um, Brooklady distilleries, which is um, in reality uh, a distillery, distillery that covers three single malts, Brooklady pour Charlotte Octomore, and a little jewel that we found in the basket, which is uh, a, a local craft, uh, craft uh, gene, the botanist, uh, we realize that not only we have this uh, big trend of uh, high-end uh, coming, but there is a massive trend, which we knew, but it was confirmed, of authenticity, traceability, and organic. Mm. So based on this, um, I would say, uh, open eye, um, we decided, I decided to, um, to have someone in my team dedicated for M&A, and I said, I want you to uh, cover the whole actual market in order to understand what is uh, available uh, within this uh, trend, um, in particular in single malt and in other categories. Uh, so we focus first on single malt. Uh, the point is that uh, the single malt that are high in price are very new, except one or two that do exist but uh, are absolutely not available on the market. To be, um, to be bought. So uh, they are all startup that uh, or relaunch of existing distilleries. And they, they are newcomers, uh, either they were less than five years or less than 10 years. So they are mm -hmm. small distilleries uh, with high provenance, uh, with very strong uh, positioning. Uh, and we are looking for these ones. So there is a lot of marketing stories, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I launch it yeah. uh, fast and then I try to run away, I sell and I run away. But we are looking for people with authenticity and real um, mm. savoir-faire and, 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 uh, and, sure. and uh, reality of product. So mm. we, we are still looking, but we, we, we search uh, for, uh, for two years and uh, we bought almost at the same time one day after the other. So within two days, we bought a first distillery in France, which is uh, Domaine des Hautes Glaces, which is at one hour in the Alps, uh, one hour from Grenoble, uh, which is a, a, an incredible, uh, unique place. Um, two people running, the founder and one guy working with him. And this guy has a, 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 um, a, an incredible ne local network of farmers who grow barley just and right, but mostly barley, totally organic barley. And he knows every single plot where the barley is coming from and he's able to distill 
every single plot and segregate and mm. eventually do a different liquid uh, for each of it. So it's mm. absolutely amazing in terms of quality and traceability. There is none of, none of it mm. today in, in the market. And the day after, uh, we bought another distillery, which name is uh, Westland. Uh, Westland is in Seattle, a uh, Washington yeah. state. So if you live mm. there or nearby or mm. you stop by Seattle, please uh, spend a few minutes because it's a quite unique uh, place. Uh, I was with these guys, they, they were in Paris two days ago. And uh, today in the US, the single malt, the, the American single malt is a new category. So they were the second distillery to, to cover only single malt because you have distilleries in the US who distill single malt, but they do other yeah, blend or uh, vodka yeah. or gin or whatever. There are today only four single malt distilleries, American single malt distilleries in the US, just doing single malt, and it's part of it. And as well, it's a barley from Washington state, totally mm. organic. We know the traceability. We know the traceability of every single cask. Part of the cask are coming mm. from the state as well, etc., etc. So we play with these two newcomers in the group, the high provenance, the traceability, the organic part, and then, of course, we play on different liquids and, uh, and some creativity mm. in terms of flavor and so forth. So it's, it's a very good addition to the, to, to the family. Uh, we mm. created a whiskey business unit of uh, single malt, uh, but the open eye was the, the first one who joined us. Mm. Uh, fortunately, it has been done before me, so it was much easier for me <laughs> to identify uh, the option and mm. the potential. Uh, and step by step, we learn, but it's true that um, we tried to find uh, this uh, very unique and singular uh, positioning, but with a reality of liquid and product. Uh, and there is a massive trend today in the world. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, in, in your own reality, when you're a, a client and a consumer, you're looking for something that fits you, but that most of your friends or colleagues uh, or family don't have. So you want to be different. So people are searching and looking for this kind of very niche brands and product today. Uh, and this is a, a massive reality in our industry and in the whiskey single malt. It's very new, so it's mm. very niche and small distilleries. So the whole interest of it is how to develop it in their home market first and then abroad. So this is all the discussion we had this week because we are working in on the five-year plan. And as you age this product, it's a minimum of five years aging, at least five year aging. Um, and what is the potential rolling uh, out of the home market? Having in mind that sometimes your home market is not the most mature one. If you look at mm. American single malt today, it's still early stage and baby steps in the US. Whereas when you speak about American single malt outside of the US, people are much more advanced. Oh it's very yes. funny, much more advanced and they are asking for it like mm. crazy. So it is kind of debate that we have internally that when do we start to export? Does it make sense to export early or not? And if so, what are the markets that are the most mature to welcome this kind of very unique and niche uh, brands and products? Yes. And to jump on this authenticity, we also own some lands, you know, in the French Alps where we cultivate with horses, not to pollute because it's in a preserved area. You know, um, joint collaboration with the Aga Khan, you know, who's working on protecting the butterflies and the pure air and nature. Uh, so we do have also, in and uh, most of our cleansing products are using those uh, Alps plant extracts. And this, this demand for authenticity more and more. And also uh, jumping on what you said, it's not that obvious also in the beauty world, but the Made in France label, which for mm -hmm. some time was forgotten because all the brands became very international. Everything could be made anywhere. And we kept, you know, within the company that we have only uh, one place to manufacture all our products, which is Pontoise, Northern Paris, where we keep the employees, we respect the employees, and we bring that level of authenticity that is passing, you know, year by year, and that the consumer are very much in demand now. And we see that on the social media at different level. They know where it is coming from. And we do cultivate. We have another factory in Strasbourg where we do only the fragrances there, which is the second one. So, you know, you both mentioned a number of points that are very important for the millennials. Authenticity, social media, yes. traceability. So 
tell us a little bit how at Clarence or before mm -hmm. at Gucci or Vuitton, how are you using all these tools that the millennials have launched? Which, by the way, now there is this sense that millennialization means that any one of us is acting yeah. more and more often like a millennial. So it's yeah. no longer just a category of age. Tot so tell us a Totally. Bit. I mean, the good news is that the millennials are getting aged like us, you know, <laughs> year after year. <laughs> the second good news is that they are getting more money because their income is increasing. And they now represent, <laughs> as you know, uh, in advanced countries, more, much more than half of the whole luxury consumption. 80% uh, of the growth, and I think, depending on countries, 43 in uh, you know more mature markets to China, over 70% of the luxury consumption. How we attract them, touch them, you know, everything happened on a uh, smartphone, you know, in China. That's where mm -hmm. all of that millennialization, if we can say so, you know, is is appearing, and uh, we have new ways to communicate with them. And one very important, you know. In, especially in the old continent, you know, in Europe, the luxury was called exclusive. Now luxury is inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the luxury brands in fashion that did that the best at first was Gucci, mm -hmm. when, you know, these new campaigns had been uh, generated mm -hmm. in terms of bringing not only content, but engagement, and again, doing what is working the most with the younger segments of uh, millennials, which is community building. And by really touching you know, their heart, their head uh, after, and uh, by going to their home you know, in a fast way with uh, you know, online sales or digital delivery you know, activities, we are able really to rebuild those communities and we are able to touch you know, them in a much faster, efficient way. Then their values, you know, which you know, didn't allow them at the beginning, younger generation of millennials had the, a bit the values, but not the money to afford what they really wanted. But we know those values are authenticity. Uh, they don't want overpromise. They are quite good on judgment, even though they can be fooled by a lot of apps, you know, and uh, lately there have been some apps in France, you know, and uh, around Europe, you know, one called Yuka, where you have people who come from nowhere, have no expertise, but they give judgment about the brands. Is this skincare or beauty product good, bad, Boom. no? You have no expert. I mean, it's a bunch of people, sometimes 25 years old, but they tell you something about brands. But people listen to them. And we can see on younger generation that there's a kind of comeback to people being more re reasonable, realistic, coming back to real studies, you know. Uh, and facts that really um, confirm, you know, what could be their, uh, the truth that is behind what is being happening. So we are facing in that world, you know, of open communication and one-to-one uh, -one marketing permanently, uh, yes, the increase of a lot of new brands. You know, if you take the U.S. market, uh, 80 to 85 percent of the, what is called, you know, the luxury uh, beauty brands, is coming from new uh, digital native brands and new brands that didn't happen. You know, the major brands, you know, uh, the Lauders, the Us, you know, the Royal, we, we only took 15% of new markets. So obviously the big capitalistic group, you know, are able to purchase these companies. So they spend billions and billions to try to bring that. But definitely in terms of, uh, you know, millennials behavior, uh, the new R&D and approach and way to get to them rapidly is also, you know, trying to engage in a different way. So if you're a big group, you buy companies. If you are more medium sized and believe in yourself, you know, it's more bringing, you know, true message, authentic product and the experience we, uh, we mentioned earlier on. And one of the things also that you mentioned that 80% of the growth in the luxury beauty comes from mm. new brands. Yes one of the fundamentals besides the fact that it's about you know launch and the values which you both <laughs> mentioned is also direct to consumer yes. so in the world whether it's in beauty or traditionally mm. in in your space in spirits you had a whole system of intermediaries how yeah. do you see these new business models challenging the statu quo of of uh, distribution but it's quite uh, honestly for for the um, the spirit industry is quite uh, good news because today Sorry, <coughs> we have a lot of difficulty to have direct contact with our clients because of distribution. So, in fact, the more we have uh, direct contact through digital, the best it is. Uh, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. 
But yeah, Todd Barney. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So I'll <laughs> jump on it. Yes, it depends also on your dis <coughs> dis distribution model, but definitely everything direct to consumer. But everything direct to consumer is, is a different story. Uh, and a reason why 80% of those new brands had been upcoming, you know, I didn't go into too much detail, but was the challenges to retail, you know. What retail offered, especially the department store model, <coughs> you know, didn't resonate with the consumer anymore. They just didn't have to go to a place to find everything they needed. You know, the post-World War II, uh, you know, evolution where people had no, much, no many places to go, could just had to go actually to a train station, to a department store to get the products they wanted. I mean, it's over, as we know. And the challenges of the retail, retailers, you know, in America, you know, uh, how many stores Macy's have closed over the last uh, uh, three years, you know, how much, you know, you know, the sales of the world that you read in the news yesterday are going bankrupt, but a lot of retailers are being challenged. And millennials, part of them don't go to those stores and don't buy. So. The direct-to-consumer, and I join what Valérie said, is a huge opportunity because we are able to engage directly one-on-one -on -one with all of them and in many cases try to transact <coughs> directly with them, you know. No, and I know I'll, start, I'll start what oh. Valérie might be saying <laughs> afterwards when she can, which yeah. is that you've been able to open a retail store in Shanghai two years ago that's really successful, <laughs> and you're going to open another one and I know because a few years ago we worked in the classroom on a project with Louis XIII and mm. in the US you still have this leftover from the prohibition where you have a mm. whole system yes. of you know, people in peers and then they tell yeah. you which store. So you don't even control the stores where you are actually sold and all you can <coughs> do is advise them. Mm. Yes. And so more and more you're going to try to challenge the status yeah, quo. I think the, the digital is a big uh, game changer because in our industry, <coughs> the only moment where we have direct contact us with our clients is uh, travel retail. So if you have a, an opportunity to be present in an airport, for example, you can have access and you can interact with your clients and can know your clients and their expectations. Today, <coughs> digital gives us the opportunity to interact, to know each other, and, and to sell. Mm. Today in China, we sell 20% of our mm. business in directly. Wow. Mm. Digital, uh, which is a massive change. It was zero two years ago. So 20% of our business is digital today in China, all across all our brands. And for Louis because it's a luxury brand, we decided to have our own stores. Mm. So we have two stores in China, one in Harrods. If you go to Harrods, please uh, stop, mm -hmm. where we can interact as well. Uh, and this is a, a real uh, interesting moment. Mm. I think for us, the most uh, key uh, game changer is digital, for sure. Because the young generation, they want education and they want to understand who you are. Today in China, keep in mind that every year, the official age of drinking is 18. We have 60 to 70 million people, theoretically, who are able to drink because they mm -hmm. turn 18 every year. So it's the French population, more or less. So how to educate these guys? It's so massive, it's absolutely impossible. So digital is a way to reach them, for them to reach us, and to educate this young generation because they are extremely uh, savvy. They are extremely curious and they want to know everything about you. Mm. So digital is definitely the game changer. Then it does translate or not in business and in sales. This is another story. But education is absolutely important and this is a way to create the relationship and the contact. And you can do it massively and at scale through digital today. And it was not the case in the past. So for us, the game changer is this one. And then after, here and there, you can have some uh, different experiences because we won't be able uh, tomorrow to have uh, 200 stores in uh, in China and anyway it's not uh, it's not the point, but this is additional and it has a, it's um, covering an, another objective. But definitely, digital transaction or not is a game changer today. Okay. Mm. So last question: Both of you have lived in all continents, and as you know, now being leading the brands that you both lead, how do you feel your international perspective has enriched or, it, or how is it guiding you? You know, we have some Columbia Business School grad of 
all levels who are interested, yeah. they, you know, should they move? Tell us a little bit, Christophe, first, from I mean, your perspective, how important was that? Both Valérie and myself can only tell you, yes, move, go <laughs> everywhere. Uh, it's a different level. The first, which, you know, is so critical, I think, is really consumers' understanding. Really understanding the uh, consumers' behavior, uh, understanding the behavior of our on employees or teams, you know, in different world, uh, different part. And, uh, and finally, you know, being able to manage, you know, multi, uh, multicultural people, multicultural teams, because it's, it's, and you know, I hate to be politically correct, there's something I hate in life, but really having multicultural teams is so much more enriching, efficient, uh, you know, eye-opening, and stimulating for everyone. And that's the only thing I can really encourage. And I can tell you that even <coughs> in Clarence, where I am now, but previous companies, the, the main breaks, I mean, the main challenges we were facing were always coming from people not understanding each other. And it seems stupid, you feel, no, it's not, you know, in 2018, that's gone, it doesn't happen. It happens every single day. And I had an example, again, yesterday we were talking, I won't mention details, but about, you know, some teams, you know, headquarter teams sending products to try in the country. People say, oh, it's very interesting, we're going to test it this way to make sure, you know, how we could build that huge opportunity. And the person in Paris understanding, no, they refuse it, they don't like it, they question us. So it's coming back to those basic fundamentals that help us in managing. And ultimately, you know, more on the marketing side and building, you know, a more relevant brand to all of our consumers around the world, understanding, you know, what are the, you know, the common grounds and which are these uh, localization we talked about at the very beginning, you know, how we really adapt, which compromise we should make and not. In mass market, it's quite easy. In luxury, it's really understanding and refining this mix between offer, who you are, what is your message, and what, is, what are the co consumers' needs you need to adapt to. And having within you know, all your own teams, you, know, you need to educate. And I would say training, training, training is uh, mm. critical for us. No, I, I totally agree with you, Christophe, because in fact, uh, as we are saying, everybody travel today. So our clients travel uh, all over the globe, uh, especially in, in luxury. So uh, it's not just uh, understanding every single market, but it's to understand different cultures in every single market. Because if you are in an international place, like uh, London, New York, uh, Paris, mm. Shanghai, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Dubai, you, need, you have in local, local clientele, but you have a lot of visitors or foreigners. So in the end, if you're today, you understand only your own clients mm. or own culture in your own country, honestly, you're dead. It's over. Mm. It's absolutely over. So what we do in luxury and uh, including at, uh, at uh, Rémi Cointreau is we, 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 we put in place what we call programs to follow the client. And for example, when a, a client of Louis Vuitton in a country is going to come and visit Paris, uh, you, the teams, know each other and they call each other and say, hey, my best client, VIC, very important client or not, is going to come. Who can welcome this person at Champs-Élysées or in uh, Nice or in uh, whatever place? And they, they make the appointment because as I was mentioning uh, before, the personal contact and the personal relationship matters. It makes a big difference. When you have a, a, um, a personal, uh, uh, a personal, um, how do you call it in the... In, yeah, when you have a, a personal shopper, sorry, a personal shopper in the luxury world who work in a store and move to another brand, I can tell you, they bring part of their clientele. Uh, right. And if you cannot create this bridge between the countries, you lose part of your, your impact and, and your connection to the brand. So what we do in the luxury brands, we create these programs on how to follow the, cl uh, the clients, and it's very efficient, and we do exactly the same at Louis The teams, when they have a very good client moving for, um, for example, for a vacation or for the summer or for a certain or just visiting, they introduce their colleague in the countries and say, hey guys, I have this person from Dubai, I have this person from Tokyo coming in London or in Paris, who's going to take care? But you need to know the culture of these guys. So we need people and we need uh, staff and, and team who are totally international, who are able to adjust and to understand 
because uh, the cultures are so different sometimes that if you don't adjust a minimum and, and try to understand the insight, as Christophe was mentioning, you, nothing is going to happen. So you need teams that are totally uh, cultural, uh, uh, open-minded, uh, who have live abroad, so that's why you're absolutely right. What we try to build in the, in the, in the team is people who are totally international, who live abroad, a maximum of uh, nationalities, and try to uh, uh, mix all these uh, culture and nationalities in order to create uh, richness. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely uh, critical today, in luxury in particular, mm -hmm. because clients don't stay in their country for uh, personal no. or pro professional reasons. They travel all over the, the globe and they expect the same service and the same attention everywhere, which is the most difficult because it's all about people. So we are all mm. different. So the way I'm going to welcome Katie mm. will be very different from the way Christophe mm. is going to welcome Katie. But you need a minimum of standard while you adjust to the single person. So this is really, really the most important. And when you know someone in a brand or in a luxury brand or in a store, this is making the difference because you feel special. And in luxury, you need to feel special. If you don't feel yes. special, it's just transactional. Just mm -hmm. I come, I buy a bag, I, I buy a bag. Okay, so what? But if I come to a store and Katie welcomes me and say, hey, you know what, Valerie, next time you go to another city, my colleague mm -hmm. is going to welcome you and you will be treated very in a very special way because you're a very special mm -hmm. client then I create this emotional bond and relationship with a, with a brand mm -hmm. so it's all, all just about uh, culture and creating these bonds uh, uh, all over the globe but this is really important today this is mm -hmm. critical in luxury in particular so we all sound French but we all have traveled <laughs> abroad so don't hold it against us we're not you know, just sounding French so I think we may have time for one question if there is one Yep. <coughs> See. And, apartments. and one, of, one of the things that I'm observing, but it may be a trend, it may not be, that our, new, our two buildings that we are starting next year will have top-of-the-line firms, international, that come from abroad, that want to be in key parts of the building. So they are either anchor investors or anchor renters. Uh, in order to redesign the building, we provide the architecture to respond to what their image wants to be, to also provide the, the branding, both of the building and of the product, so that people feel that they're yeah. going to that building of that corporation. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I'm curious whether this is part of a new trend, at least it happens to 100% uh, to of our new buildings in Santiago. We are seeing some areas of Santiago that have similar mm. developments where if top of the line international firms come, mm. they want to be there, and it's part of the upbringing and an and image of the region and the people <coughs> that live there, etc. Two questions to both of you. Is this just an accident? No. Or is this part of a trend, number one? And number two, uh, if it is part of a trend or is something that you people want to do, how does one interact with your firm? In our case, these firms have come to Chile and want to do that, but how do we proactively de design <coughs> this, discuss this, develop it, provide the financing or whatever is necessary? Thank you. So I'm not sure I'm going to answer precisely you know, to your question, but yes, why? Luxury brands, we need consistency, coherence, recognition, but we have to be one. And, you know, building a headquarters, an office, is, you know, representing everything we are. Our employees represent ourselves, they are the front end, but the building is, you know, essential. Uh, in our company called Clarence, the family bought land. We built the most ecological building in the whole, country, in the whole Paris. We consume no electricity, so sometimes it's a trouble, the light goes off by itself, and you're in a meeting, and it's off, on, off, on. Uh, we have bees on the roof. Uh, we have no air conditioning system. We have just specific air controlling system, which can be dry at the time. But, you know, it's a huge building that represents the value <coughs> of a brand and of a company. It goes again, and employees leave it. They want that. You know, they just don't want to go in a place. Now the influence of the WeWorks of the world and all these uh, platforms make that. 
employees live again in a community. Our consumers do. You know, our employees are our ambassadors. You know how much they post on their personal Instagram everywhere. You know, if they show their work in a, uh, sorry for the word, excuse my French, but for the crappy place and it's not exciting and it's not good, they won't place, they won't leave the brand. They won't leave who you are, who you represent. And the design, uh, especially on fashion and top luxury, is you know even more important. And uh, how can we bring more you know beauty to the world, which is by the way the mission of our company is bring you know uh, a more beautiful world. But by design, by bringing something that brings added value. And it's not only true at our headquarters, but every office we do, we do exactly the same in our own company is to open very nice, friendly, modern, open space, inclusive uh, <laughs> space. And the design is critical, so I think you're doing the right thing. Yeah, I so. think uh, it's more and more um, tailor-made, as uh, we were mentioning, and it's part of uh, offices is exactly the same. I've redone my um, headquarter two years ago from scratch. I hated it when I, when I joined, and I said to my uh, shareholders, we are going to uh, uh, really uh, destroy everything and rebuild everything, but we asked the team what they wanted and how they wanted to be built, and we did something very uh, special and unique that they designed themselves, and they wanted some, uh, it was totally uh, what I call a factory floor. Uh, we are um, a very small team in uh, headquarters in, in, in Paris, we are 120. But I asked the team, what do you want? Because mm. I'm never there, I travel all the time. So I said, I don't need uh, any office, but I uh, don't need uh, any desk, but you, you live, most of you, you live there all the time. So what do you want? Do you want to know each other? Do you want to be able to, spoke, to speak easily? Blah, blah, blah. And you want a space uh, to, um, to have a, uh, coffee, lunch, um, to play together. We have a little um, uh, football um, table, baby foot in French, um, et, cetera, et cetera, And they design what they wanted. But it's really tailor-made, and it does correspond mm. to, the, to their need. Mm. And it's extremely important today, because I think we spend a, a lot of time uh, working yes. and the space where you are. So I'm not surprised mm. that people want really to appropriate themselves uh, the, the, the space. Mm. It want, they yeah. want to be, to be yeah. their space. Yes, and we invite also, as you know now, before office was office, now everything is interactive. We <coughs> invite our influencers in office, so you need to have a special design atmosphere. We even invite our consumers, which maybe didn't happen, you know, years ago, but now we invite consumers to exchange. So it's, you know, it, it's a dual role there. Well, Thank you. I would One time out, there? I don't know if we, we can. We can yes. still do, okay. One. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Chapelier Floquet. Can you talk a little bit about going into uh, Nairobi and, and Lagos with Louis Trez? <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, I was in Lagos um, two years and a half ago, and we'll, I will be there early December. So um, it's a weird place, first of all. I don't know who knows uh, Lagos, but uh, it's a weird place, but uh, there are very uh, interesting uh, clientele there. So the way we, um, we address it is uh, definitely to try to, to sell to hand sell uh, Louis XIII to the, to the right clientele. So to cherry pick who could be in target. And from the person who bought the first uh, decanter, for example, is to, as I said, organize uh, dinner and events in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, to know most of our clients uh, one by one. Um, this is qu quite recent because to tell you the truth, uh, before I joined, I joined in the middle of the crisis of China. It was a big trouble. Um, because we were out of stock of Louis XIII most of the time, because uh, the beauty of my, my job is that on some products, I, I work uh, under allocation, because nature is what it is. So depending on the crop, we get more or less uh, liquid every year, and we age it. So relationship to time is very different. So as I mentioned, uh, Louis XIII is mostly over 100 uh, years uh, liquid. So I don't have a lot of options every year. I know more or less how many decanters I can sell a year. And as before the crisis of China, China was taking a big part of the cake of the allocation, mm. I couldn't sell officially one decanter in Africa, zero. We never allocated before the crisis of China officially one decanter to Africa. Doesn't mean that Nature doesn't like emptiness, doesn't mean that some decanter didn't arrive in Africa mm. or some African resident couldn't get it. But officially, my team in Africa never had officially any Louis XIII to sell. So when the crisis arrived and China collapsed, the big opportunity was to say any single country and region could have access to the allocation of Louis XIII. So what we have done in particular for Africa, 
where our uh, headquarters is based in Cape Town. Uh, the lady who's in charge of Africa, she's a very strong Irish lady, she said, Valerie, I want someone to take care of uh, Louis XIII and someone who's going to take care of um, the, the best bar, hotel, restaurants and the best, I would say, caviste, uh, fine, fine wine stores to sell Louis XIII and to hand uh, sell Louis XIII to the best client of Africa. So we started in South Africa to test with quite big success. Then the same person, who's a German person, by the way, living in South Africa is taking care of Nigeria, who supposed with the local team to identify what are the best bar, hotel, restaurants, and eventually uh, retail stores to sell with Red and to organize this kind of event and, and, and uh, dinners uh, in order to know our clients and to uh, hand sell uh, the product. So the way we work in, in, uh, in Nigeria, in Lagos, is exactly the same as we were where we, the way we, we work everywhere in the world. It's quite recent because, as I mentioned, uh, till four years ago, I have not one decanter to be allocated to Africa, unfortunately. But I can tell you, the, the, the target, the people who are in target with we trade in Africa, they know pretty well mm. because they travel, as I said. They travel, they were able to buy in duty-free in other countries, or they were able to ask their friends to bring it through their own network including private jet and blah, blah, blah. So I can tell you that uh, the, the key people who are in Target, they know the brand pretty well, but we were not able to activate because we had no, no allocation in the past. So the same business model as, as uh, other countries, we started but very recently in Nigeria. So last question and then that's it. Thank you. My question is simple. Amazon, <laughs> America, uh, is it a competitor? <laughs> is it a partner? Uh, is it a supporter? Uh, you look at millennials and younger. I know I have a couple in, in my house. Um, they don't, uh, and I'm from Chicago, uh, Michigan Avenue, Oak Street, yep. some very successful luxury shopping malls. Sure. They don't even go to the mall, but they're not 20 yet. Um, how do you prepare? Partnership, threat? How do you look at them? Now, in my actual business, and then I will ask uh, Christophe to answer. In my actual business, uh, first of all, the U.S. is a very unique um, uh, territory for us because, because of the three-tier system and the regulation of, uh, of um, alcohol. Uh, alcohol. But uh, in, in the U.S., for example, if you want to buy online, I cannot sell to you direct, first of all. Oh, unfortunately, I would love to, but I cannot. But you can buy through pu pure players that they can ship most of the time within their state or very few states it's very regulated, very complex. Uh, you never know who can sell to whom, where, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, it's very regulated. So you can buy online either on a retailer site or on a pure player site. Uh, and this is very specific to the US, for sure. Uh, Amazon, for me, uh, is not a, 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 a competitor or a threat. On the opposite, if I take China where so far, we will see if it changes tomorrow. It can change overnight, but uh, in China, we work for the last two to three years. As I mentioned, it was zero uh, two years ago almost. Now it's 20% of our activity. Um, we sell to JD.com. I visit them in Beijing two years ago. We shake hands, and uh, since then, we, we work very well together. And uh, Tmall. Within these um, two big uh, players, we play our brands, and each brand has a different um, uh, mission, positioning, and, and way of doing business. So. I told them, if you respect the positioning of each brand and the way we run the business, Louis XIII on one side and the rest on the other side, we can play a lot of games together. And the most important was to say, so they are the Amazon of the situation in China, uh, my point was to say what your clients are looking for today. This is the most important. At the time, it didn't change in two years, maybe it will change in the future, the Chinese were buying online for alcohol and spirits, very simple. They wanted real products, because you know in China you have still have a lot of counterfeiting. So they wanted real products, they want the guarantee of a real product. They want a fair price, they're not looking for discount. They want the fair price and they want the service. They want to be delivered within two hours in big cities and within 24 hours in other cities. Last but not least, they want assortment. If you provide them this, they're fine. They're happy, super happy in China. So this is what we provide. And on Tmall, for example, we have a site in the site for Louis XIII because we consider we are different. And we, it's, a, it's a common interest to do it this way. So we have a site in the site. 
it works pretty well. At least it, it set the price positioning of the of the of the of the brand in the market, uh, and the whole storytelling and so forth. So we found a way to work together. There is no competition; it's not a threat. I think it's absolutely normal to work with these guys, but they need to respect you, and you need to respect them, and we need to play by our own rules. But in China, it worked extremely well. Honestly, I think everybody understood that uh, there's a common interest. In America, unfortunately, it's much more complex than that. Uh, my gut feeling, but maybe I'm totally wrong, is that one day for uh, spirits and alcohol, uh, something is going to happen because honestly, the way it's, it's managed is a kind of uh, way, way far away from what the clients are looking for. So there will there's such a gap that at one moment something might happen, but it's by regulation, so it has to be voted on, blah, blah, blah. But today we are totally out of the market in the US. That's why in my activity and industry, digital is very little because the US is not playing the game. We cannot play the game in the US. Uh, so today digital in, in our industry is mostly China, but recent, two years ago, a little bit in the UK, period. So we are very late, but the boom is coming. It's, it's obvious. And for us, it's a fantastic opportunity because as I mentioned, we want to know our clients. Our clients want to interact with us. Uh, and this is a, one of the best ways is, is digital for sure. So it has to change. I, I hope it's going to change. In the, and I know that most of my competitors have, have exactly the same uh, reaction in the US, but uh, we, don't, uh, we don't lead and we don't control. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's going to change pretty much. China is very much ahead by far. Uh, and it's a good news because we can bench and we can learn. But uh, it's quite basic huh, in China, as I said, assortment, real product, the right price, del fast delivery. It seems basic, but if you achieve it in China, it's already a, a good deal huh, for the client. So then we will learn, and I'm sure it's going to be more sophisticated mm. in the near future. Yeah. Yes, I mean, <coughs> it's one of the best questions, for sure, as always, when we talk about Amazon, but you know, there are two Amazons, and compared to a luxury brand, you know, uh, Amazon is an amazing, uh, you know, retailer able to bring everything to anybody very fast, very quick, very transactional. I think the first challenge is really their values, you know, what values they really have and represent. Do they represent our values of respecting people, you know, bringing authenticity? I'm not sure. So they are definitely not a brand builder. Uh, then you have, you know, Amazon marketing services, as you know, on the marketing data side, <laughs> uh, they become for beauty. Uh, I think it's now, uh, don't quote me, but it's either 43 or 48 percent of the beauty searches in the U.S. are happening on Amazon. So someone looking for information is going definitely through Amazon. So you have the two. You have the uh, data marketing house of Amazon that is becoming more and more powerful that everyone needs to use, and there's the pure retail side. But unlike the China model like Tmall, in Tmall, uh, you know, the, um, Alibaba really understood that they needed to build a shopping mall, because Tmall is a mall where you have your own boutique. So you're yourself, you benefit from the traffic, like in a physical mall, you know, a, a Simon Mall or uh, whoever uh, uh, mall in the US. And what they allow at Alibaba is to catch the data of the consumers, <coughs> which Amazon does not. They keep control of that data, which for you know, a brand building exercise is very difficult because we need the data, we need the name, we need to be able to interact directly with our consumers. And that makes the two models very different and very challenging. Um, the third point is that, as you, we know, Amazon is optimizing to bring the best value to consumers, so all the algorithm and all the systems are made to bring the lower price as possible. It's not always part of the brand building exercise. So depending on the maturity of your brand, you know, it could be good to be there to gain uh, a bit <coughs> of uh, visibility. It could be good you know, to gain access, more easy access to millions of people to your products. But what would be the cycle? And once you enter, you know, and uh, shake hands, you know, you could be then after that obliged to overinvest all the pos possible profit you could be making, you know, on um, on the marketing activities to make sure that your sales don't drop. So it's a double sword uh, type of collaboration whenever you start with them because it can bring you amazing visibility, access to consumer success, but at what price, you know, in terms of your branding and uh, your medium long term business, and that's. 
very interesting discussion because they are smart, they are great people, and you know, I personally enjoy a lot, uh, you know, discussions with them. But as we conclude, I think most luxury brands right now, whether they're small or big, mm -hmm. you know, Gen Z is actually, which um, you may have at home, they're going more towards the emotion, the authenticity, and as much as we all shop on Amazon, and to be honest, I've tried to not shop as much as on Amazon because I've had two fake things in the last three months. So I'm boycotting yeah. Amazon, but that's a different <laughs> story. Uh, my point is that it's more and more, they want reality, they want authenticity, they want emotions, they want to discover. And I don't think, you know, uh, Amazon is an amazing tool, an amazing success story. It's really the, you know, convenience but it doesn't check any of the boxes of luxury, whether it's emotional, mm. whether it's brand building, whether it's storytelling, there is none of that. So I'm not sure, unless they evolve, and they certainly mm. have the capacity of evolving, I'm not sure they're going to get married. So thank you all mm. so much for those state of feeling longer. Thank you. For coming. Thank you.